In this episode, we present Art Law, the Frank Stella Special, featuring interviews with legendary artist Frank Stella. So these are our cutout shapes, uh, just uh, uh, positioned in space. And NSU Art Museum and Chief Curator Bonnie Clearwater. Uh, the other thing that he questioned was the whole notion that a painting had to be on a flat surface. Whoever said a painting has to be on a flat surface? It's all ahead on Art Law. Funding for Art Law was made possible by Friends of Art and Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. This project is sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. Hi, my name is Jamani and I'll be coming to you from the NSU Art Museum. And this, this right here, is Art Law. Coming to you from the NSU Art Museum here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for a very special art loft featuring the works of Frank Stella. But first up, we're going to meet with Bonnie Clearwater, who is the chief curator and director of the NSU Art Museum. So let's sit back, relax, let's check out this interview. The exhibition is Frank Stella Experiment and Change. Um, the exhibition spans his entire 60-year career, uh, but it's not really a retrospective. The goal was to really illuminate the way he thinks, processes, brings it all together. The studio created a model of the museum and uh, started laying out um, and juxtaposing works in, um, in this model of, for the museum. And it was really with the idea that one could look from one, one room into another and make these kinds of connections and realize it is, there is a continuity. It does make sense. For a lot of people, it's very hard for them to understand how did an artist who started his career making these very formal black band paintings, these very austere uh, paintings, how does he end up with this amazing, exuberant, um, chaotic drift of color and form. The point was not to take people through step by step in a kind of logical, chronological, or stylistic way, but to show that at this stage of his career, it all makes sense. It's all part of one artist thinking and experimenting and changing, and yet, it's all of one thought. Ultimately, what needed to be achieved in modern art was a sense of pure painting. If they tried to get rid of anything that would create a sense of space in the painting because it denied the fact that the painting was a flat surface. Stella was aware that there were these rules and he felt that it was important to work within those rules, but he never took any of it at face value. He questioned every one of those rules and found a way of exercising his free will within those parameters. So for instance, um, the idea that a painting was supposed to be rectangular or square. And he basically would say, well, whoever said Painting has to be rectangular or square. From most of art history, paintings were on or murals on walls. And therefore, the shape of the painting was dictated by the architecture. So a window or a door or molding um, will affect the shape of the painting. And it became natural to, for him to start creating shaped paintings. Uh, the other thing that he questioned was the whole notion that a painting had to be on a flat surface. 
who ever said painting has to be on a flat surface. When again, throughout most of art history, most of history, painting was on a very um, varied surface. Think of the uh, cave paintings. So consequently, instead of making paintings that are on a flat surface, he started creating surfaces of a whole varied topography. Stella's experimented with materials throughout his career, um, even when he was working with um, paint on canvas. Uh, the, the paint he very often used were, you know, house paint, uh, enamel paint. Of course, that wasn't so unusual in that many of the abstract expressionists, such as um, Jackson Pollock, certainly used um, enamel paint in his, his canvases. For Stella, it was also the physical uh, attributes of uh, the materials he used. Um, it's very clear that even in the most static type of arrangement on his paintings, where we have the stripes or bands, um, they, uh, the paint, there, there's a sense of movement and shimmer and shine uh, that is there even in uh, the early black paintings. Uh, the same thing when he's using metallics, there's a shine, there's a movement in the lines that he uses when there's the, that they form a diagonal in the uh, corners of his, um, of his mitered maze paintings and, and the uh, concentric squares create a kind of directional uh, movement that just um, buzzes right through the painting. Recently, he was casting aluminum, which is very heavy, and believe me, we've had to reinforce all the walls in order to support those works. Um, but then he also, in the most recent pieces, some of the most uh, largest works in this show, he was able to cast in fiberglass so that uh, now uh, there is this complete sense of they, they look like they're floating away and they are much lighter uh, than the previous works. One of uh, the early um, statements that Stella made in 1964 is probably one of the most repeated statements about modern art. And uh, he, it was, what you see is what you see. And um, mostly that was taken to um, understand that what's there is there and you don't need to um, bring in any outside illusion, any uh, narrative, any imagery into the work. What's there is all that matters for you to see. Um, but one of the things that I had realized in working with, um, with Stella's work is that it really also dealt with how you understand what it is that you're seeing. And that what he sees is not necessarily what you see. Um, so the work really does explore different um, uh, ways of understanding your own sight and the, and the fallacy of your sight, making you aware of how your mind is seeing. And what he's, he might see something completely different than you see or the next person sees, but what you're seeing is the most important and most valid part of the experience of his work. I'm here at this exhibition for Frank Stella. Right. That spans his six-decade career. Right. I mean, right. he literally was too legit to quit, right? Well, exactly. <laughs> well, so... He's one of the most creative spirits in American art. Um, Frank Stella is probably the one of, if not the most, one of the most important living American artists. Yeah. And he began his career in the late 50s after going to Andover. Okay. And then he went to Princeton, and he began to exhibit as early as 1960, wow. when Leo Castelli gave him a show, which was huge. This is Deauville, which is one of his circuit series, and it reminds me of the Piazza Navona in 
in Rome. Okay. You know, it's this amazing racetrack. It's right, part of his right. race track series. He's explained on these pictures that once it was designed and put onto the canvas, that he and a friend were painted it and they used house paint. And that's one of the distinctive qualities of his work, is that he's using house paint, which gives it a certain um, texture and it gives it a certain look and it has a tremendous um, surface quality. So what he's interested in too, with this picture, is also the fact that you see it all at once, but you focus on one part, and he's exploring um, peripheral vision, so that you see it, you see all parts of it, but when you focus on this part, that part goes out of focus for you, so that he's really exploring how we see as human beings. So it's a remarkable study in the idea of painting, and you're very much aware that it's a painting, and he's exploring the dimensions and the limits of abstraction. Well, his art is always about painting, and it's about the process of painting, and it's about painting as a lyrical sort of form of expression, right. as well as a very geometric. This is extremely lyrical, as at the same time it's very precise. Right. And that is you feel it moving, you feel it coming back on itself. Like it has a kind of finite, I mean, infinite quality. Yeah. It's really remarkable. And I think his works are inspiring to, you know, generations and generations of artists. So for me being here, enjoying this exhibit, what's the one thing you want me to take with me? I want you to take with you the fact that Stella is a painter, and he's one of the most important painters in America, and that he has reinvented himself and been his creative self for more than 60 years, and that's hard. Because when you make it when you're 23, what are you gonna do when you're 33? And what are you gonna do when you're 43? And now he's 81, and he's still working. And just, hey, just that's me, great. <laughs> we, we gotta do better, all right. <laughs> You're awesome. Is that good? Thank you very much. Good, okay. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I had. Oh, we had a ball. This is great. I'm, yeah. I'm good. I don't know okay. about you, but I'm good. Are all we right. good? Thank you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right, the moment we've all been waiting for. Frank Stella and Bonnie Clearwater are gonna give us an amazing exclusive tour of NSU's exhibition, Frank Stella, Experiment and Change. Hold on, sit back, don't move, stay tuned. Here we go. This is not a retrospective, but yet we are starting with one of your earliest works from 1958. Well, it's a kind of tradition for uh, exhibitions for older artists to begin uh, with their student work. <laughs> okay. and, and this, so I didn't want to break the tradition. Okay. And this, but, but you know what? That's quite a student work. This is something you uh, did at Princeton University. Yes, yeah, 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 uh, yes. This is uh, unsized cotton duck, which you could buy fairly cheaply in rolls, and then so you're able to uh, roll out a big piece and then work on it and paint on it. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a landscape or basically a seascape in a way or the beach it, you know if it isn't the beach I don't know what it is and uh, the banana fish are running all over the beach oh, so the, so the it, it's um, Salinger's a perfect day for banana, banana fish it, yeah and um, so the uh, so I did associate the ochre colorist mm -hmm. a, um, in reference to the banana fish in mm -hmm. that. but um, but it does have that kind of landscape quality mm -hmm. to it yeah So you always worked in series. Is there a reason uh, why you prefer working in series? No, but I mean, once you start, I mean, it, I don't think of it exactly as a series. There's a fair amount of difference between the paintings that are in the series. Mm -hmm. So the ideas evolve. And talk about racetracks. Here is um, Deauville, mm -hmm. which um, is one of an, a special. It's a, yeah, it's a, a premier French uh, uh, thoroughbred racetrack in the, in the north 
in, uh, in the north of France. Yeah. And it's in the painting itself is in the shape of a racetrack. Yeah, I can think it's kind of obvious. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you were, in a way, this was the backbone of the exhibition. It's really where we started. Was, uh, I was partly by accident, but um, because of the shape of the, the layout of the galleries, it sort of lent itself to the uh, um, a, 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 a long picture, and then the other side, another long picture. So, 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 the it, so it made a kind of spine. Or, and um, uh, and yeah. and we did bring the other, the companion piece from this from 1970. That's on the other side of the wall, yes. and it's in a way the viewer has to do the same thing that you would do in a racetrack to see both as you'd have to go all the way around to, the two yeah, walls. Right. It's fine, not too many people talk about you in relation to landscape, but it's something that has kept coming up in our discussion. Um, uh, well, um, that's ab is my understanding, which I think is... It's, it's is accurate. <laughs> uh, no, 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 well, uh, maybe about, it might be accurate about myself, but uh, the development of uh, abstraction in the 20th century has always been keyed to landscape and to northern painting. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of inevitable. And then you make this... Um, you started shaping the canvases, mm -hmm. and this painting is from the Copper Series uh, from... Um, yeah. 1960. Right, you might say that this is a kind of leap here, uh, uh, not much of a leap, but anyway, starting to get interested in that extreme uh, of organizing your painting and your space and what you think about what a painting could be. So uh, this is a kind of uh, play on painting. Um, it's a square, I mean you could fill it out to the end following the stripes, but it, it's cut to be a, basically an L shape. But the point here is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, you can do things, you can make a gesture, you can have a shape painting. The question is, uh, at what point does it cease uh, to be a painting and become, quote unquote, an object? And so, well, we, we saw, so shaping, this is how shaping can, different ways it can go. It, you can shape in this direction where it's sort of coherent and makes a kind of sense two chevrons relating, yeah. relating to each other. And here you can uh, uh, work with certain ideas and blocks in which you, uh, the forms start to become uh, kind of irregular. So uh, there is a geometry and it makes a certain amount of sense, but it doesn't follow, uh, for example, it doesn't end up being symmetrical. There's almost a, a flapping motion in here. It does look like it could fly away as do these. Uh -huh. They have that kind of well, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, the whole idea it it comes in later on in the um, in the paintings that we make later. But uh, we use the uh, it, lift is sort of important. So uh, if you have a flat shape and you cut it out, but then if you put a uh, if you curve the surface top and bottom, then you can create a uh, a surface that can have lift. This is on Delta, which you said you consider your first black yeah, painting. Yeah, it is the first yeah. uh, black painting because uh, <clears throat> it's like the other dark paintings that are in there, and it, it happened the same way. It was really probably alternating colors, black and red, and then I painted out basically the reddish color. And uh, it seemed like um, I was really painting out. The painting wasn't going anywhere. And then when I looked at it later, the idea uh, it didn't seem so bad, not that it seemed so great, but that uh, there was a possibility in which that uh, I could have basically uh, make do with a one color painting. I mean, actually it could have been all red stripes, but black works better. <laughs> and, by, and the monochrome kept it all on, uh, flat, yeah. as opposed to vacillating in space. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, but it, it, with this painting though, it still has very much the, um, the drips, the um, expressionistic uh, yeah, brushstroke well, yeah, of the abstract yeah, expressionist. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's another landscape, Delta. A delta, of course. What compelled you to start working on such an enormous uh, just the num It's a, just a question of numbers, I guess. And this was a kind of way of trying to get the color in and sort of open things up. 
uh, that the space was not so much on the surface. Actually, I hate to say it, but it's a, uh, it's a kind of a illusionistic uh, <clears throat> way of handling the color. Yeah. Well, it's, um, I, it's one canvas and there are uh, um, mm -hmm. duplicate images, mm -hmm. but because of the way, and the same color scheme, just a reverse mm -hmm. of the color, but as a result, they both, each side operates differently visually. To you, to me. not to me. Not to you. <laughs> what, what do you see? It's, a, it's just, <laughs> it's just uh, I see it as one painting with, paint. with two sides. But then that became very important to you, is to build up a mm -hmm. surface on which to paint. Well, I, to make shapes uh, was a little bit interesting. Rather than to draw the shapes on a surface, Somehow I got into that, and I think it's simply a variation on collage. So you can cut, uh, if you have shapes and you cut them out of a piece of paper, you use those pieces and then uh, literally. So these are, are cut out shapes, uh, just uh, uh, positioned in space. Yeah, but I didn't realize that's the until same thing there. Simple. I mean, these are both basically collages. Yes. You can flatten them, and upstairs, that's what happens. Right. You can see uh, a breakaway here in trying to take the same kind of thing. It's basically the same kind of relief in, in terms of a background, but trying to allow the geometry to become itself to be more organic and not, uh, and not have the surfaces limited to, a, uh, to plain geometry. And so you have here basically uh, what amounts to uh, slightly more complicated surfaces, basically topology comes into play and the only problem with it is it's difficult <laughs> to do and expensive but uh, the geometry is uh, available to us so it's not that difficult it can be done and this is one of the most recent works it's from 2017 yes, yes. Right. the same kind of lift the effervescence mm -hmm. that um, is in and, early <clears throat> works here yeah and this was an earlier version this is actually a casting of, uh, of that kind of image, the smoke image uh, here. So as you can see, it, it, it works quite well. It has worked. Well, the form is actually smoke rings. Uh, yes, it, it, their forms derived from uh, uh, photographs of smoke in the, <clears throat> in the, actually in a black box, but they were smoke rings dispersing. One of my favorite um, movements is from this painting uh -huh. into the next room. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I mean, you get the same kind of centrifugal force going mm -hmm. from the Saskatoon painting. Well, there's a, the, I think actually it's interesting that the lightness of this continues, yeah, continues even though there. that's actually very heavy, <laughs> but it, it doesn't feel that way. So this is a. Uh, um, what we call the, basically it's the archive and it has models and drawings. And um, it's pretty straightforward. They're just drawings from, uh, they're not organized in any particular way, but uh, uh, they relate to pretty much everything that's in the exhibition. There are versions here of what's out there. And these drawings were, uh, um, again, a lot before we began to make things with the tubular uh, forms and things like that. So there's, there's uh, I don't know if you can call it a lag or if you can say that uh, some things come through and some things don't. And then these are drawings of parts of pieces that get made. And um, you can see things change a fair amount, but, uh, and then finally they have to be measured <laughs> and built. And again, this is really being very bored at a meeting of the Council of the United States in Italy, but some of those uh, are not so different from uh, the way the smoke, link, uh, smoke looks in the piece that we just saw outside. Uh, the cross between smoke and the clouds. And so that's it. I mean, that's uh, uh, a lot of the stuff is wasn't exhibited before because it wasn't exhibitable.
<laughs> there wasn't much point in, uh, in the kind of scattered drawings and, bit, and bits and pieces. But in a way now, it, it seems to add up to a little bit. The academic interest, I suppose. Well, also the exhibition subtitle is Experiment and Change. So um, this game gives the viewer the opportunity to really see you thinking and working, I, experimenting and changing. But for the better or for the worse? <laughs> That's, I think for sure for the better. Thank you for joining us on this very special Frank Still episode. It's been a complete honor for me just to be here. Now remember, you can connect with us on social media anytime at Art Loft SFL. Now, for Art Loft, I'm Jamani Anambi. Now remember, art imitates life, so do what? Live a beautiful life. Peace. Money for Art Loft is made possible by Friends of Art and Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. This project is sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture.